Hi guys, welcome to part two of Unboxing a Power 9. My name is Steve Bradshaw and in the next few minutes I'm going to walk you through looking at this server in a bit more detail. We're going to be uh, showing you the ports, uh, we're going to be showing you some of the connections that uh, you will be using to hook it up to the wired world and a few things to look out for, some explanations of the inside and the out. Let's start with the sexy end, the bit you'll see the most of. So this is the front of the Power 9 server. Uh, this is a tower model, it's on its side, it's not going to be living like this all the time, it's just easier for me to show you this. Uh, rack mount ones are more common these days, uh, but uh, this is what we've got to work with. Our rack mount one does look remarkably similar. There's that rack mounted version flashing away. And it lives in that rack with the other boys and girls. But, so you can see both. So, looking at the front of the Power 9, the first thing that you'll notice is there is no DVD drive. Okay, IBM does not include those internally anymore. Uh, that is a good thing. Believe it or not, it is cheaper now to attach an external one and then into the one and of course it's more secure if you do want to attach a dvd you do need to buy a usb dvd comes in a box look at that high-tech labeling uh, take it find one of the usb ports that are blue there is one on the front and two on the back simply attach that and your opto one will appear okay can't use any dvd it's got to be one of the ibm approved ones they are cheaper believe it or not to buy an external than they were to have the internal and you have the option and if you have many servers just buy one and then you can use them on all right so what else have we got on the front here well there's quite a few blanking plates because this does not have many physical devices because this is one of the shoe new shiny g models the 9041 golf so this gives me the option for beautiful nvme Right, uh, so NVMe was available in the older ones, of course, but the nice thing about this one is we've got the front mounted uh, NVMe, so there's two of them, there and there, each of them 3.2 gigabytes, and that is going to yield me 16 mirrored disks, each of 200, uh, in this particular machine that I'm going to share out across multiple partitions. More on that in another video. Okay, so as well as that, two physical disks there and the rest of the blanking plates. I've got down in the corner here, living proof that IBM believes that young people should work on power systems. That is the model number and the serial number, written in a font that's only legible to people under 25 years old. Thank you, IBM. The all-important SRC panel. This has now made an appearance back on the front, uh, rather than being hidden away inside a pull-out drawer that you thought was going to snap off. Up and down, enter, all-important power button, and your system attention-grabbing lights. Uh, what was I talking about with the SRCs? This is a Power 8. Hello, Power 8. My old friend. I had to push a button to get the SRC panel out. Okay, that was the most robust one they ever made. You ever worked on a Power 7 or a Power 6? Every time you pulled it out, you thought you were going to snap it off. That would be a very expensive sounding noise. All right, so moving on. That was the front. Very beautiful. We'll be looking inside in just a moment. Here is the back, the business end of the server. First thing you'll notice, the more astute and uh, alert of you, is there are four power supplies on this particular model. Okay, that is quite common on a tower version. Uh, on the rack mounted ones, you tend to find more that there are two power supplies, but it does depend on your geography and your choice. Four power supplies is four times 900 watts. You only need two of those four to actually make the machine work. The idea being you have two going from one power source and two from another. So if you're in a data center, maybe two different phases, two different PDUs. Maybe you've got two different UPSs, one on a UPS, one, uh, one pair on a UPS, and one pair maybe on a utility power supply. Doesn't matter which two. It could be that one, that one's got power, that one, that one, that one, that one. Any combination you want to come up with, but there needs to be two. If you only have the two times 1400 watt supplies, you only need one of those power supplies to be working. So that does make life a little simpler. Okay, that's the power supplies. All right, let's just take a quick look up here. Uh, a couple of network cards, a serial connection, and four USBs. So what are they about? The blue USBs were the ones I was telling you about earlier. You can use those in the partitions. That's USB 3, a bit faster, so that uh, DVD drive I was telling you about earlier, that could also hook up to one of these. Be warned, if you do put it into each port, every time you put it into a new port, you will get a new OPT number. So if we use it on the front first, you get up to one, then up two, up three. Doesn't matter, but can be a little bit confusing sometimes. Again, you can use these with um, thumb drives as well, make RMS things. I'm sure of more on that in other videos. These next two network cards, you're not going to use this for normal communication with your machine. These are specifically for connecting 
HMCs or for you to connect to the ASME, the Advanced System Machine Interface. That's the hypervisor effectively, and that card is basically the presentation to the outside world of the hypervisor. That hypervisor is the thing that allows us to carve up and make multiple logical machines, LPARs, on our one physical server. So, for connecting two different HMCs, USB ports here, these USBs, they're not blue, blue you can use, that's USB 3. These USBs, you'd only really be using those for a machine connecting interface. The most common one is a UPS connection. So if you have a UPS that's got a data connection that signals your server when it's going to power down or needs to power down because there's been a power failure, that's where you're going to be hooking those up to. And then finally, this looks like a network connection. It is RJ45, but it's actually a serial card. That's why you can see a little serial symbol next to it. And that is most common with our AIX brethren. That's how they roll. Right, so uh, if we look now at the PCI cards, the, the slots are all numbered. You can see that my uh, slots three and four are blanked off. Uh, actually, two, three, and four are blanked off because this is a single processor model. More on that later. But I get to use C5 all the way up to C12. Okay, so that's great. That still means that I've got seven cards, so IBM was listening, even in a basic 914 model. So, got a network card there in C5. Got a SAS adapter that I'm going to be connecting some tape drives to in C6 and another network card in C11. We like dual network cards because that way we can connect to multiple switches. I know these network cards have multiple ports, but you want to be protecting against card failures or uh, as well as switch failures. So not that that happens often, but why not? These cards are particularly cheap. So we will be twinning those up. But there are a couple of exceptions. If you wanted to have a PC operations ethernet console, Right, so the ops console rather than a HMC, then you do need to be using a specific port on a specific card. Now, technically these cards actually can be in any slot, but by default, if you've got two cards like this, then it's gonna be this C11 card that you're gonna be hooking it up to, and it's gonna be the top slot. Now, this is the T1 port. When it's in rack mounted mode, it's obvious because it's one, two, three, four, we count down. When it's standing up, it's the far right-hand side. Just imagine where the motherboard is and it's the furthest one away. So, okay, I've got the writing down there, it's the furthest one away. That's T1, T2, T3, T4. So we're gonna be using that one if we're using Ops Console. More on that in another video as well. Okay, so now it's in the back. Let's take a quick look at the inside, the brains of the outfit. If you watch the first one, you'll hear remember me saying that it is just a single finger. So easy to open that. And as we do it, you'll just see the whole assembly just slides backwards. Once it's slid back like that, you can just lift it out with one hand, take the cover off and lay it down. I also mentioned to you that there's some really useful documentation on the back here. Uh, so it's just well worth looking at it and uh, understanding. There we see details of the back and all the locations, details of the front, all the locations. Okay, and then details of the inside as well. Okay, and what the lights mean. Can be very useful to look at. All right, if we take a look now inside, at the back end we got the PCIe Gen 4, so this is a G model. Okay, I get an explanation of the speeds and the locations and the numbers of them there. So starting in that C1, we've got the FSP, that's the Flexible Service Processor, or System Processor, I think it's service, which included all of those HMC ports, the ASME access I was telling you about before. This is only a single socket machine, so the next three are not connected. More on that in just a moment. So this side, I've got my six and my, my one there, so. All right, so when you look inside, I can see a number of these where there is nothing. So you can see the open teeth there. Then I can see the card. So in this case, that's my network card, then my SAS card, a couple more spares, and then my other network card. But what I'm looking for now is to make sure that they're in absolutely perpendicular. So they're standing right upright they're not to one side that's not lifted up or half down that this blade is sat absolutely at 90 degrees to the chassis that wonderfully perpendicular those are all sat in nicely so we're just checking they haven't shaken loose during the shipping same on that side same on that side all right okay we'll take a quick look inside again so this was the airflow so i'll just remove the airflow controller remember this was a single socket machine so this side empty so no processor there no access to the extra dims 
this single socket machine. That's the heat sink, process is underneath it. Lurking down there, that does the thinking. This just keeps it cool. All right, so there are 12 memory slots that are free. Those have got the blanking plates because I have four times 32 gig in this particular machine. I'm not gonna bother taking those out because that's hard to do with one hand and I really should be grounded. So, blanking plate, real memory card. Blanking plate is black plastic, the real memory card there, the thinking bit, you can see the chips on it. So I'm just checking to make sure those are flat and that these little um, clips that hold them in place are 100% perpendicular. If they were skewed off to the outsides, as I showed you before, then there would be a problem and I wouldn't want to power it up until they were seated properly. Now I'll just show you the back end of the storage planar. So we saw the NVMEs at the front end of that, but this is the back end. And the most important part about that, you've got your two data connectors, make sure they're actually in nice and tight and the power supply that's feeding that board there. All right, one more data connector at the top. Those all look to be nice and flush, nothing standing to one side. So, that machine looking handy. Let's just sit that airflow back in there again. When you do put that back in, just sit it underneath like that. Just run your finger to make sure it's underneath that bar. All right, and then we can pop the top back on. I'll do that later, because that does need two hands just to position it. I mentioned in the unpacking video of volume uh, one uh, that these labels can be useful. So this is one of the labels I took off the external packaging of the box. And we get things like the model number in a font that we can read when you're, <coughs> let's say over 20, <coughs> over 30, <coughs> over 40, <coughs> over 50. Um, then serial number of the machine, quite handy. Uh, okay, and then some details about the system number and the sales order number, which can be handy for when you're actually registering the machine with the IBM ESS website. I'd keep this uh, because not only do you have details of, of what it was that was shipped, you should really take um, more detail than that, but it's still nice to compare it. But these details about the system number, the serial number, and the model number are useful. Please be aware that the system number and the serial number are not the same. Okay, that pretty much completes the show for part two. If part three, if you come and join me, we'll actually be connecting this up um, to both a HMC and then possibly also an ops console if I've got the time. Hope you'll join me then. Cheers.